Well, good to see you, Terry. I really appreciate your time. Um, get a chance to talk with you and um, spend some time celebrating Earth Day together. Indeed, we have a lot to work on, but a lot to celebrate. <laughs> Terry, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about you personally. Most of us in the environmental kind of advocacy realm have uh, can trace our stories back to some childhood experience or something that really um, moved us and lit us up around the environment. Was there such a, a moment for you? There was. I don't know if uh, any of your viewers remember Sea Hunt, the old black and white television series with Lloyd Bridges, but he inspired <laughs> me to want to be a diver and uh, about the ocean, even when I was living in Milwaukee as a kid, as far away from the ocean as you can get. And when I was 12, my family moved to Los Angeles, gave me a diving certification course for my birthday. And I, in fact, became Mike Nelson from Sea Hunt. And uh, we then moved to Australia and I came back 10 years later to college and went to that same spot where I had that first diving experience and all of the kelp, all of the wonder, everything I had seen, all the species were gone. And that was because of polluted runoff yeah. from the streets and gardens of Los Angeles. And that made me aware of the human impact on the environment and the fact that we had to take action. Mm. That is profound. I mean, it's it's rare that we get to have the experience of seeing something um, change so rapidly in such a short period of time. So I can imagine that that really had an impact. Um, one of the things that pops out for me about that um, story is just your focus on kelp. Um, you know, kelp being a really fast growing um, plant, um, we have some interest in that here at CEC. We spend a lot of time thinking about and working towards uh, rapid carbon sequestration as a tool for climate. Is, um, is that something that you have an area of interest in? And what, what uh, you know, what would you say about that? That's one of those things that can pay for itself. I mean, unlike just planting trees and maybe selling carbon credits as they sequester carbon, as you know, kelp, uh, giant kelp here in Southern California grows as much as two feet a day. It supported a major industry for many, many years uh, in Southern California, harvesting the kelp, making it into carrageenan, which then goes in as a thickener mm. into tooth. So it can be one of those things that sequesters carbon in unique ways and it supports 800 different species. It's one of the most abundant mm. uh, habitats on earth and most don't know anything about it and they call it seaweed. Hmm. Yeah, that, it's, so, it's so profound. There's so many um, nature-based tools that we could be tapping and that feels like one um, that we just know so little about. So absolutely. Um, and I'm glad that you're, you're, you're hip to that. Well, you know, having grown up or at least spending a part of your childhood in California, and then as you've just spoken to, um, seeing its evolution and change for, for good and bad, um, how, you know, do you agree with this? I feel like California is kind of ground zero in many regards in terms of the, both the impacts of climate change as well as the potential solutions. Um, in fact, we were talking backstage earlier about long-term drought, and you shared a success story coming out of Sun Valley. I think that was Sun Valley, California, not Sun, Sun Valley, Idaho. Right. You care to share that? Well, yes. Um, look, I think California invented smog. We literally invented the term smog, mm -hmm. and then we uh, created the Air Resources Board and other regulatory entities and laws to clean it up. We had a Clean Air Act before the feds did. We had a Clean Water Act before the feds did. And uh, so, yes, California tends to invent the, or not invent these problems, but be part of these problems and then invent the solutions. Well, when it comes to water, there is a very modest community here in Los Angeles County at the base of the Los Angeles uh, National Forest uh, called Sun Valley, as you mentioned, and uh, it's home to about 8,000 people and some light industries. And every year when it rains, the water comes funneling down the mountains and floods this tiny community with great damage to the industrial area and so on. And so the county drew up a plan to get that water drained into the LA River and out to the ocean. Mm. But they wanted $50 million from this little community, which of course they didn't have. So a planner came up with the idea to dig up an old dilapidated city park, put underneath it some cisterns, old mm -hmm. Roman style technology, refill the park. So you have a brand new park mm. and capture that water and sell it to its neighbors and use it. So 
the result is that today, Sun Valley has uh, captures about 8,000 acre feet of water, which is about four times what it needs for its uh, community uh, every year, and uh, sells the excess to the Department of Water and Power and others. And so they have a, sol a cost-effective solution to the problem and um, a way to store the water and a way to generate revenue for the city. You know, that really flips the, the script quite a bit, huh? right? Because right now in, we have this kind of odd set of circumstances or in, in California where we treat water like a pollutant as soon as it hits our land, right? Even though it's exactly what we, it's a resource that we need. So we treat it like a literally as a non-point source pollution all the way to the ocean. And then, uh, then we stick a straw in the ocean, pull it back out, and desalinate it for drinking water. Um, it it really makes me think about how it's kind of a luxury um, in California to not know where your water comes from. It's it's an odd, like I said, it's an odd set of circumstances. Um, do you do much work in this area in terms of just um, the importance of water and knowing where it comes from? We do, and I think you touched on really the root of most environmental problems is that people think food comes from the supermarket. They mm. think water comes from the tap. Uh, they think that, uh, that the fuel that drives them around uh, just comes from the pump at the gas station. Uh, people don't understand what uh, the supply chain is that we are fortunate enough to be on the receiving end of, especially in Southern California or in California in general or in the US, but the impact that it has on the rest of the world and what are much more sustainable options. So when it comes to water, um, we, as you may know, I, I now lead Seventh Generation Advisors, which is a small nonprofit advisory firm that helps uh, municipalities and regional governments with their climate solutions. And we have on our website a, a stormwater database that is examples like the one we discussed from Sun Valley. And it uh, gives policymakers access to the documents and to the people that put those programs together, and then also ways to finance them. And that's very important now in the post-COVID economy because so many cities struggle now with getting their budgets back in, in gear, especially Santa Barbara, where I am, Santa Monica, um, places that rely a lot on tourism. So here in Santa Monica, for example, our sustainability department in the city went from 17 people down to three. Mm. So they just don't have the time to go out and look for these solutions and then find the financing. So mm -hmm. our stormwater database uh, does both. And mm -hmm. uh, there are financing out there. I think the Biden administration now in its uh, new unveiled, newly unveiled uh, uh, infrastructure plan has got uh, money in there for uh, stormwater and water management. And so now it's just a matter of being able to match the need with that funding and with the good ideas. That's such a great um, kind of public-private partnership. You know, that's kind of a, a, a buzzword that we use these days, but I, um, I appreciated that as an example. Um, you know, Terry, another thing that's been on my mind, and you and I talked about this backstage a little bit too, is that one of the great challenges of the time that we're in is that there are these, and you're speaking to it a bit here, these overlapping multiple crises that we're facing all at once, right? So, and that would have the impact, of course, on Santa Monica's, um, you know, that that keys all the way down to staffing levels. But at, even at just the very personal and human level, we see um, this increase in kind of mental health impacts of all of those pieces, you know, all of those crises um, weaving together. We see an increase in depression and anxiety and, and this sense of powerlessness, um, which really makes it all the more important to understand where we have personal agency and where our per personal actions matter. I know this is an area of great passion for you. I wonder if you could share what tools or tricks um, that you have developed um, for kind of just everyday individuals in terms of agency and a, a sense of um, being able to control, you know, affect the situation that we're in. Well, yes. And, and, you know, first of all, I'd mentioned that probably the best thing anyone can do is to be restored by getting out in nature, mm -hmm. um, you know, make the time to go for that walk in a local park or, you know, maybe go up into the local mountains and hike or down to the beach. Um, I, I don't know anybody who doesn't tell me that when they do that, 
they are restored, that they feel regenerated and reconnected and re-inspired. So I would just encourage people to take advantage, especially in Southern California, we're surrounded by all kinds of great opportunities to get outdoors. Um, but the other thing is, again, on our website at sevengenerationadvisors.org, uh, um, we have uh, a personal climate action center. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, other websites out there that help you mark, you know, measure your carbon footprint and things like that. And, uh, and then take action, but they can be very confusing. Maybe they require you to do a lot of math and you just don't have the time for that. So we curated from all of those different sites. We didn't try to reinvent the wheel. We curated from the best sites, uh, what are the easiest ways to decide what you wanna do and to see what an impact that can have. So for example, one of our first tips was reminding people that if you switch your laundry from hot water to cold, um, number one, all of the detergents on the market today work just as well in either. It's a falsehood to think that you have to have um, hot water uh, to, to get your clothes clean. And you can save um, about a quarter of the carbon footprint of the average American just by making that one switch. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and you save money. That's the other thing. I think that's another way is to harness people's uh, sense of accomplishment when they can measure it. So it's uh, in terms of their health, in terms of saving money, uh, inflating your tires uh, on your car actually saves fuel. Um, and, and obviously having a more fuel efficient car and, and taking mass transit when you can, you, that starts to add up and you realize it. And then there's also just some fun things which maybe give you peace of mind in other ways. I know all of us get tired nowadays of doing Zoom calls and and being on these things and having to be on video, but I'm gonna just share a little thing here by turning off my camera for a moment. Um, uh, oh, the, little, the graphic didn't come up, but uh, I normally have a graphic there that explains that 96% of the energy used on a Zoom call is for your camera. So when you don't need to be seen on screen, turn that thing off and, uh, and save the energy and maybe that'll allow you to eat your breakfast while you're, while you're on your Zoom call or whatever <laughs> else it might be. Uh, get, away, get away with maybe not being fully dressed up or what have you. Um, and, and again, I just, I think part of the environmental message has to be around health, around the health of your family, realizing that what you're doing is not just good for the planet or polar bears in a faraway place you'll never see. It's, it's good for your immediate environment and your health and safety. Right on, because uh, we are the environment. We are nature, right? So healthy planet, healthy us, healthy planet. Um, very, I'm really glad you underscored that point. And it's, um, and again, that mental health component is so important right now. The other thing that I was just picking up on, you know, as we were talking is, I, I like to kind of think of it as, as this as a, like a pebble effect, right? So we have the, there's the importance of what you can do individually for yourself and your family. Maybe we could um, drop the pebble and go one lit, one ring out, and that is, you know, at the neighborhood or kind of local level. If there are actions that you uh, that you are particularly engaged in, or that you encourage people to be engaged in. Well, definitely, um, and you know, every community has uh, has again nature based solutions, whether that's parks or. Uh, little wetlands or even vegetated swales or other things that, uh, that might be in the neighborhood, gardens, community gardens, mm -hmm. uh, and any little bit of nature, any bit of, of concrete we can take up, any bit of uh, groundwater that we can cause to percolate back into the aquifers underneath all of our communities, uh, the more we're saving water, the more we're saving energy, because as you well know, a lot of our water travels great distances across the state to, to get to us. Uh, and then we spend a lot on energy to power it and pump it into our homes and then even more to dump it out in the ocean, as you mentioned. So, uh, so every gallon of water saved uh, saves energy and saves money and saves the environment. So I think in a community basis to, to work with your uh, local city on getting more kids out into parks, helping uh, improve the parkland around your communities or uh, other restoration projects that you might have, getting involved with organizations like the Community Environmental Council uh, and the other great nonprofits up in, in Santa Barbara volunteering. I know it might be trite to say, help mm -hmm. with the beach clean up, and I wish we didn't have to clean up our beaches, but, uh, but that's something everyone can do a couple times a year with local organizations. Mm -hmm. And it has that benefit of getting you and your family off the chair and doing something that, uh, that helps everyone in your community, including yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think we're really just getting to the heart of kind of CEC's model, right? Which is that, you know, work at the individual level, at the neighborhood level or school or business or wherever it is that you have influence, your church, your your book club, then radiate out from there, get involved with city politics if you can, even if that just means showing up to a city council meeting to advocate for more bikes or whatever, whatever your issue is. Mm -hmm. And then it radiates out into regional work. There's more and more kind of regional effort um, happening around climate. And then I'm going to take us to the next ring, which you, um, in a previous life, um, as EPA director for Cal EPA, um, you know, the, the, at the state level, talk just for a moment, if you would, about the importance of California in the, in the larger climate context, right? Because we have um, a real opportunity, I think, with California to, to leverage what we have here and make a um, significant difference at, kind of at the global scale. And I find that to be a helpful um, tool for folks who are like, well, you know, climate change is so big, how, you know, what can I do or how, um, why does it matter? So let's talk a little bit about the, the importance of California in this space. Well, California really is outsized, and you're right. I was fortunate when I was EPA secretary for Governor Schwarzenegger to be able to enact uh, a lot of policies, uh, obviously with the help of our legislature, but in some cases regulatory, and uh, and really to make California a leader with our Million Solar Roofs initiative that also mm -hmm. helped us through the last recession, where uh, building trades were put to work, uh, putting solar panels on rooftops that otherwise they would have been idled. Um, and, um, and, and of course, more efficient vehicles, which when California sets a standard, the rest of the country can follow us instead of the federal model, because again, we have those unique rights under the Clean Air Act. And, um, uh, and just because of our size, you know, we're the fifth largest economy on the planet if we were a separate country. Mm -hmm. So when we set a policy and do something um, with our building standards, for example, every time we pass an ordinance uh, or update our, our uh, uh, building codes for energy efficiency or other kinds of uh, efficiency um, or reducing toxins in the built environment and so forth, the federal government within three to five years ends up following that and it becomes the standard for the country and then ultimately mm -hmm. the world. Uh, the same thing is true with our energy efficiency uh, through the California uh, uh, Energy Commission where they set standards for appliances and, and even your flat screen TVs and so on and so forth. Uh, and needless to say, manufacturers, if, they're, if they wanna meet this huge marketplace, they don't then manufacture something less efficient for everyone else. So we drive that, uh, that change. So uh, yeah, California is, is really a leader and everywhere I go, people say, well, how did you do it? And how does this apply to, to our region of the world? And so we've proselytized that to a lot of different places. And I want to just add one other thing, you know, and this gets to where people can be personally engaged okay. without, without making this political, because I think that, that this is not something that should divide the left and the right. It should be something that when people understand can unite them because a strong economy and a strong environment are two sides of the same coin. But, you know, when you come to vote, you got to vote for the candidates that understand that and are willing to support good environmental policy, mm -hmm. uh, because that is our health and our safety, as well as just uh, taking care of the environment. Uh, and then when you do that, you get things like happen with me. I'm just full disclosure. I'm a Democrat who worked for a Republican governor. And look at all we got done. Mm -hmm. And much of that was with bipartisan support once we had someone like Arnold who could sell that to some of his Republican colleagues in the legislature and in the rest of the state. Uh, and then obviously we brought along uh, the Democrats and we managed to get an awful lot done in that uh, seven years we were in office. Great point. Thanks for bringing that up and reminding us that history. And we can even see, um, you know, we can see that now, of course, because the Biden administration um, has picked up on a number of goals and objectives that California has been promoting, right? So the um, 30 by the um, Governor Newsom's 30 by 30 land protection goal was picked up by the Biden administration, and there were a handful of others in the um, Biden administration's kind of climate initiative that stemmed out of California. And then, I, you know, I would add that it's been our experience as well that when um, cities or regions, including Santa Barbara or Ventura or San Luis Obispo, um, kind of push ahead of the state at times, it gives the state um, both a story and some courage or backbone, right? They can say, oh, you know, 
maybe we should be advancing our climate goals, our dead, our, 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 our targets a little more quickly because look at the um, cities that have set 100% renewable energy targets. So it really does matter. I think that we are in a unique position in California to um, even as small communities like ours, even if we're not in LA or a San Francisco, to be able to affect global change, um, given the kind of levers that you just mentioned. Very much so. And going back to your point about the pebble in the pond, uh, my wife, Leslie, works on uh, plastics legislation and trying to reduce mm -hmm. single use plastics and works with the Clean Seas Coalition to try to keep all that plastic waste out of our oceans and so on. And uh, when in the Schwarzenegger administration, with his support, we tried to get a single use plastic bag ban in effect, and it was knocked down by industry. Um, and uh, so then she and her colleagues went to every city, every county, and mm -hmm. in two years, 127 cities and counties in California had enacted either fees on plastic bags or bans. And then, of course, industry said, wait, wait, we don't want this patchwork. Uh, mm -hmm. So, OK, we'll support a statewide measure. And then that in turn um, led to passage in New York. Some of uh, my wife's colleagues in New York went there. And again, they faced some setbacks and uh, overcame them. But again, it was after the localities took action first. And then state legislators said, all right, we see where this is moving. We see what the people want. And then they follow. Yeah. Excellent. Another another great success story. I'd say um, there's a there will be um, touching on many of these things throughout Earth Day in terms of plastic reductions and solar, but I, I think that you've given us um, kind of heart in terms of how, um, again, individual action or very neighborhood local action can, and grassroots action really can help move the needle. Thank you, Terry, for all of that. Um, well, we've talked about quite a lot today. We talked about the importance of um, restoration personally uh, out in nature. We've talked about um, where, you know, where our love for this work comes from. Um, I thought I might just close by asking you, is there anything, any particular habit that you are, you're working on or that you are, that's kind of up for you right now? I know for me, it's, a, um, I've been working for a couple of years on reducing food waste and then taking what food does get wasted and turning it into compost and getting into my garden garden and, and all of that. What about you? Well, uh, th thank you for mentioning waste. I, I, I'm working on a number of projects in India and elsewhere to try to get to zero waste. I really think mm -hmm. that is one of the most important things we can be doing as a planet, as a society, uh, to take pressure off natural ecosystems uh, and stop wasting what we have. But, um, but my personal one is uh, in the last 10 years, the average American has gained 10 pounds. Now, for many of us, uh, I think it was even just during COVID, many of us gained 10 pounds, um, but myself included. And so what that means uh, before the airlines cut back travel in during COVID, that they were burning 350 million more gallons of jet fuel every year because of that extra 10 pounds all of us were carrying. And there's some uncalculated amount that's being burned by cars that are schlepping around all that fat. I'm wearing a loose sweater today, so you can't <laughs> see just how fat I've gotten. But uh, but I've I've determined that for my health and the planet's, I'm going to lose that ten pounds over the next year. Way to bring that one right on. Um, well, I really appreciate your time. It was good to see you again. Um, happy Earth Day, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. You guys are doing great work. I can't believe it's 50 years. Time flies. You've done so much great work. I hope everyone supports you and learns from the CEC. And I'll leave you with this inspiration from Shakespeare, mm -hmm. uh, my favorite author, who said that nature's bequest gives nothing but doth lend. And so when nature calls thee to be gone, what acceptable legacy canst thou leave? Mm -hmm. Well, the things that you're trying to get people to do and teach them to do and inspire them to do are a legacy that even William Shakespeare would be writing sonnets and plays about. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, Terry. So long.